morning. My name is Samuel Morris. This is Elementary English, and I'm glad you're here this morning. Today we're going to go over determining main idea. This is a big one that you're going to use in every grade level and even outside of school. It's the skill you might use most often when reading. So let's think back just a couple of weeks. We talked about authors purpose, author's perspective, and while those are very important, determining main idea is something that overarches the authorial composition of it. It's really at its core what the writing is about. So the main idea is defined like this. Main idea is the most important idea about the topic. Now if you think back about a month, maybe six weeks ago, we talked about topic and theme. And remember that topic is the person, the place, the thing, or the idea that the writing is mainly about. Now main idea is going to be the most important idea about that topic. This will make a little more sense as we look at a few examples together. But it may be best practice, and what we'll do today, is to find out the topic first. Identify that person, that place, the thing, or the idea that the writing is mainly about, and then identify the most important idea about that topic. Sometimes the writing will even do it for you. Sometimes the main idea appears directly in the first few sentences. So remember, we're going to identify the topic first and then find the most important point or the author's most important idea about that topic. For our first example, we see our National Geographic article here about the peregrine falcon, one of my personal favorite animals. Let's read this together. These falcons are formidable hunters that prey on other birds and bats in mid-flight. Peregrines hunt from above and, after sighting their prey, drop into a steep, swift dive that can top 200 miles an hour. Peregrine falcons are among the world's most common birds of prey and live on all continents except Antarctica. They prefer wide open spaces and thrive near coasts or where other shorebirds are common, but they can be found everywhere from tundra to deserts. Peregrines are even known to live on bridges and skyscrapers in major cities. Identifying the topic of that article was pretty straightforward. It was the title, Peregrine Falcons. This article is mainly about the animal, a peregrine falcon, and their habitat, their hunting patterns, things of that nature. Now that we've identified the topic, let's think again to the main idea the most important idea about this topic. We have quite a few to choose from, but remember, sometimes it's going to appear in the first few sentences. We'll look at those first few sentences one more time. These falcons are formidable hunters and prey on other birds and bats in mid-flight. Peregrines hunt from above after sighting their prey drop, and then here, the third sentence we see it. Peregrine falcons are among the world's most common birds of prey. That's it. We learn that the most important idea is that peregrine falcons are more common than you might know. And here are a bunch of facts about those birds. So the main idea, again, is finding out that topic and then the most important idea about that topic. In this article, it's that peregrine falcons exist, they're common, and they're actually in more places than you might think. For our next example, we're going to look at a quick article that was written by Kim Miller. This article is about snowflakes. Snowflakes. No two snowflakes are exactly alike. Snowflakes form in clouds and their different journeys to the ground affect their shape and size, giving each snowflake its unique identity. Very cold clouds contain water droplets and ice crystals. As water droplets attach themselves to ice crystals, they freeze, creating an even larger ice crystal. 
When this happens, water molecules line up and form a sixth-sided shape, called a hexagon. That is why all snowflakes are six-sided. The temperature of the cloud determines the shape of the ice crystal. The amount of moisture in the cloud determines the size of the ice crystal. Likewise, the more water there is in a cloud, the bigger the ice crystal will be. When several ice crystals join together, they form a snowflake. As snowflakes tumble through the air, whirling and spinning, they each take a different path to the ground. As each snowflake falls, it drifts through clouds with different temperatures and moisture levels which uniquely shapes each snowflake. The topic of that is the title, Snowflakes. Right, the, the topic that what this article was mainly about was snowflakes and how they were formed. Now let's think about the most important idea that takes place in this article about snowflakes. We have a lot of really specific details about moisture levels, ice crystals, cloud temperatures, hexagonal molecule patterns, but the most important idea, again, let's look at the first few sentences and see if we find it. No two snowflakes are exactly alike. That sounds like it to me. No two snowflakes are exactly alike. And off of that main idea is when we learn all of the different details and the process of how those are formed. So one more time, let's look at an example together and you're going to practice with the same steps. Identify the topic, what the article is mainly about, then what the most important point or idea is about that topic. For our last article, We'll look at this 2014 piece about the Kansas City Monarchs on blackpast.org. The Kansas City, Missouri Monarchs were the most prominent baseball team to play in the Negro Leagues. Formed in 1920, they were also the longest running team in the leagues, disbanding in 1965. Many famous players were on the Monarchs roster, including Hall of Fame pitcher Satchel Paige, the man responsible for breaking the color ba barrier in Major League Baseball, Jackie Robinson. The Kansas City Monarchs won several championships, including the first Negro League World Series in 1924. Formed in 1920 by owner J.L. Wilkinson, a white businessman who had formerly played baseball, but who turned to team management after an injury, the Kansas City Monarchs grew out of all out of the old all-nations barnstorming team that crisscrossed the American Midwest just before World War I. Other players came from the 25th Infantry Wreckers, an all-black baseball team recruited into the U.S. Army primarily for their playing abilities. Let's think again. What was that mainly about? What was the topic? What was the article mainly addressing? We can look to the title, too. The Kansas City Monarchs baseball team. Now, the most important point. If you had to tell somebody what you read and one thing about the Kansas City Monarchs, what would it be? We can look at the first few sentences again. The Kansas City Monarchs were the most prominent team the most prominent baseball team to play in the leagues at that time, and they were here in Kansas City. Now, you could also go on to say the really interesting facts about Satchel Paige, Jackie Robinson, and even the U.S. Army's involvement in that formation, but the most important point is that the Kansas City Monarchs were a baseball team that existed and did really well, and is an important part of our history here in Kansas City, even today. So as we think about identifying topics and main ideas, remember that it's oftentimes going to be communicated to you right away. You'll find out the topic, what the article is mainly about, oftentimes in the title or in the first few sentences. Then it's up to you to determine the most important, salient part of that article 
And a quick trick to help you is, what would you tell somebody the article was about? If you only had one shot, one sentence to explain, this is what I just read, which sentence would you use? Most of the time, that's going to be the main idea or the author's most important point, most important idea, the main idea, hence its name, of the article. So this concludes our lesson for today. Remember to practice this week. Pick up an article or find one uh, online, find something interesting to read, then practice communicating the topic and the main idea to somebody else before they read it themselves to confirm whether that was the topic or main idea. This is a really fun one to play with friends and family and you can pick different articles and all learn together. So it's been my pleasure to have you in class today. My name is Samuel Morris. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week. Hi, welcome. I'm Miss Aker, and today I'm representing my school, Hale Cook Elementary. And just want to give a shout out to all the KCPS teachers and students out there and everyone else joining us in the Kansas City metro area. Let's get started with Just Know It. For Just Know It today, we are going to match the fraction with the decimal. And this is something I know you are going to know just like that. And over here on this side, we have decimals that we see in the real world all the time, money. Um, I'm sure you've been saving up your money for a new toy or something cool that you wanna buy. Here we go, so we have 55 out of 100. So we wanna look here, 55 out of 100, 0 0.55. There we go, 83 out of 100. So we're looking, we're looking. Okay, this says 0.38, so that's 3 tenths and 8 hundredths, but this says 8. 83, so 8 tenths and 3 hundredths, 80 tenths, excuse me. So here we go, right across the way. 38 one hundredths, okay, right up here. So that's like saying 38 pennies or 38 cents out of a whole dollar. 38 cents out of 100 cents is a dollar, of a dollar. And 6 tenths, okay, so we have 0 0.6 here, but we also have 0 0.60. Hmm, well how would we represent that in money? Would we put it like this, 0 0.6, or would we do it like this? You got it, we got it. Oh, and look, they, there was one down here, $5 and 0.5. Okay, we already got that one, nice. It's time for figure it out. I have one here for you, think about it. Genevieve has 75 cents. Why does 75 out of 100 equals 0 0.75 and not 75? Well, what do you know about place value? Think about it. When we have 75, what are the different parts of that number that we can break apart? So we know there's a seven and we know there's a five. They both have the same digits, but in this one we have 70 plus five. Or another way of saying that is seven tens. You'll remember practicing place value from last week. And this one is five ones. But up here, this isn't the same as 70 or seven tens. This is in the tenths place. And we know that if Genevieve has 75 cents, we know that she has less than a dollar. So that's why 75 out of 100 or 75 cents out of 100 cents equals 0.75 and not 75. That would be a lot of money if she had that. Great work on figuring that out with me. And it is time for what's new today. And we know we've entered a new phase of our work to get together where we're taking fractions and decimals and thinking about how they're the same and how a decimal is just another way to represent a fraction. We learned that last week. Here's our learning target for today. I can read, write, and identify decimals to the hundredths place. Well, let's break that down. And we have some numbers here, not numbers, we have some vocabulary here, decimal, decimal point, tenth, and hundredth. So let's, let's go into that together. So I can read, okay, well, I know like reading is like from a book, so I'm just drawing a book there, little symbol to help me think about it. Write, okay, write, here's my pencil. 
Okay, and identify. So I'm just gonna draw some eyes, because when I identify, I can see it and I know it. Decimals, so we know decimals are parts of a fraction, so it's like a numerator and denominator, but with a decimal point. So let's write an example like 0 0.3. To the hundredths place. Well, to the hundredths place, that might be, you might be thinking, okay, I could do that, but what other places would come before the hundredths place? Let's draw a quick place value chart to see what other place values we would be doing there. So we have ones, that's the whole number, and that's where the decimal point goes. And then we have tenths, and then we have hundredths. Always forget that D. Okay, so we're gonna be identifying decimals all the way up to the hundredths place. So that could include 10 tenths, and one hundredths or hundredths. Grab your tools to do some mathematical thinking. Complete the fractions to represent the shaded part of the whole. Then write each fraction as a decimal. Okay, well this is something we definitely know how to do. How many are shaded? Two out of tenths. Two out of 10. Let's do the next one. This one has it done for us. Let's count the total parts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, let's look at this one. Ten, one is not shaded, so it must be nine. And this one, three are shaded out of ten total parts. We knew fractions just like that. But what we're working on today is writing an equivalent decimal to represent that. So we have a place value chart down here to help us with that. So let's look at this. So. Um, I can think of the tenths place right here. So there's no whole, so zero, decimal point, two. Okay, got it. All right, so let's go to this one. Same thing, no one, zero, decimal point, five tenths. Okay, here we go. Zero, decimal point, nine tenths. And no hundredths and no thousandths. Let's do the next one. Zero decimal point three. Now something we could do is put as many zeros behind that as we wanted. We could say that's 300 thousandths or we could say this is 90 hundredths. But since there's no zeros, we don't have to put the zeros there. We can just go to the farthest place value and stop there. So we say five tenths. In this instance, if we wanted to do that, we would say 90 hundredths, because that's the total number of place values we have represented there. Write a decimal and fraction for each shaded part. So we're just doing what we, we just did before. So we have four out of 10, so four tenths equals, if we think of that zero, and then the tenths place, and then the hundredths place. So these are equal, let's add our equal sign. Okay, look here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, I could have done it that way, or I could just go, oh, all but one is, so that's nine out of 10, equals, same thing, 0 0.9, or we say nine tenths. Here we go, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. 70 out of 100 equals, so look at this. This is where a lot of students get tripped up. So let's draw a little place value chart, ones, decimal point, tenths, and hundredths. So a lot of students wanna put the 70 over here, but look, we have to put each digit in a place value, so, we, and it has to be in the hundredths. So we say zero, seven, zero. So now we would read this as 70 hundredths, the same as what's written here. So this would equal 0 0.70, okay? And then here we go. All but 20 are shaded, so I know that's gonna be 80 out of 100. So use what we did out up here. We're not gonna write, we're not gonna write 0 0.08 because that would be only 8 hundredths, okay? So we're gonna put each digit in a place value. So we have 0 0.80, 80 hundredths. 
Is 0 0.4 the same as 0 0.40? Explain. Well, let's draw a quick place value chart to help us. So this is a word problem. Read, think, draw, write. We do have some models here if we needed to use them and we might come back to that. Let's think about it though. I'm thinking that a place value chart will really help me. Ones, put my decimal point, tenths, we know today's learning target is all about going up to 100, or the hundredths place, hundredths. Okay, I like to draw a line to keep them separate. So we're looking at 0 0.4 and 0 0.40. So let's write both of those in our place value chart. And zero. Now look at the difference here. There's a zero in this one, so that says four hundredths. But here, we don't have a placeholder there, so we just say four tenths. And we're trying to figure out if they're the same. They look very similar. However, in my mind, 40 seems bigger than four. But we also need to look at the place value. So let's use these models to compare. So we have four out of 10. So I'm gonna count one, two, three, four, and I'm gonna shade these four. And I'm gonna represent that as 0 0.4 or 4 tenths. And over here, I'm gonna shade 40. So I'm gonna count by tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, and I'm gonna shade that amount. Now these grids are the same size whole, but this one has bigger pieces because it's in 10 and this one has smaller pieces. So this is equal to 0 0.40 or 40 out of 100. I'm thinking back to when we um, did our Just Know It last week, and we were proving that 4 tenths, for instance, could equal 40 out of 100. And one reason is, is because we, we made 10 times as many parts in the numerator, and that made us have 10 times as many total parts. And so we have just proved that 0 0.4 or 4 tenths is in fact the same as 40 hundredths. It's just that each of the individual parts here in the 40 hundredths is gonna be smaller than one of the individual parts in the tenths. I can tell you're getting the hang of it now with those decimals and fraction equivalencies. So for today's Try It, you're gonna use what you did with me during What's New to try it on your own, to tell me the shaded part of this whole as a fraction and a decimal. Same thing for this one, except it's a hundreds grid. And then I have a question for you. Is 0 0.2 the same as 0 0.02? And that's where that place value chart is gonna come in handy. Explain, and of course you can always use a grid um, a 10 grid or a 100 grid to help you. All right, thanks for doing some math with me today. Let's end with two firework high fives. Ready, here we go. One, two, three. Shh. Ah. Shh. Ah. Hope you learned something new today. Thanks for watching. Hello, I'm Mr. Steinauer, and this is Science. Today, we're going to continue talking about energy, specifically something called the law of conservation of energy. We'll explain what that is, what it means, and how it affects our lives and the energy all around us. All you'll need for today's lesson is a notebook or something to write on and something to write with. That's going to help you keep track of what we discussed this week. So, let's get started. Before we talk about the law of conservation of energy, what that is and what it means, let's do a little bit of reviewing. We discussed at the beginning of our time with energy, we talked about the eight forms of energy that we're going to discuss and elaborate on in this unit. We've got nuclear energy, electromagnetic, thermal, sonic, which means sound, chemical, gravitational, and potential and kinetic, which are unified in one kind of energy. Where does energy go? That's what we're going to talk about today. We've talked about how energy can be transferred, how energy can be stored, and how energy can be transformed. Now today we're gonna to talk about where does it actually go and what happens to energy when it changes form. 
Now when energy is transferred, it simply moves from one object to another. For example, in a power plant, that's where electrical energy is made through different processes, mostly combustion. That electrical energy goes across wires and passed and through generators to all the way to get to our home. So it's transferred from the power plant through electrical wires, through generators, into our home. That energy stays the same form, it stays electrical, which is a kind of electromagnetic energy. But it simply moves around, it doesn't change, so it's just transferred. Energy is stored, you can think of a battery, human fat cells, even gasoline. Any way that we store or keep energy for future use, it's stored. So stored energy is just energy that can be used later. It might need to be broken down in some kind of way to be used, but it's stored and it will just sit and wait for us to use it. Finally, when energy is transformed, it changes its form. Trans change form, form. So an example of energy transformation is if you start a campfire. You might use a match, you might use a little bit of fuel, you might use some grass or some leaves. All of those have chemical energy inside of them. That chemical energy then gets converted into thermal or heat energy. Then we can also hear a campfire. If you take a moment, close your eyes, and imagine a campfire, you might hear a crackle. So that's also sonic energy coming from the campfire. So that energy, that chemical energy of the fuel you used to start the campfire got converted or changed into different kinds of energy. Heat energy, light energy, electromagnetic, and also sound energy, sonic energy. So today the main focus is on what's called the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy says that energy is not created or destroyed. It can only change. So what we mean by that is when you clap your hands, that energy that went from kinetic energy to your hands slapping together, transferred into sound energy or sonic energy, that sonic energy went into the air. So that while it was converted into sonic energy, it was still energy. That energy didn't go anywhere. It's just in the room now and it's dissipated into the air. Similarly, when you stomp on the ground, you can hear a stomp. You can feel your energy go into the ground, right? Things around you might shake a little if you stomp on the ground. And that's because you take your mechanical energy, your energy of movement, and you stomp, and that sends out vibrations. So that mechanical energy goes into the ground. And then you'll also hear that sonic energy, the energy of sound. So when we say conservation, what do we mean? What is conservation? If something is not created or destroyed, what do you think it means to conserve? To conserve means to keep. So when we say energy is conserved, that energy is kept in the universe. It is simply a different kind of energy, but it's still energy. A way you can think about it is in this example. So the dinosaurs existed 200 million years ago, 65 million years ago, pick an era. So the dinosaurs were alive. They were eating, whether they were eating plants or other dinosaurs, they were getting chemical energy from the food they ate. Then cut to 65 million years ago or so, a giant asteroid crashes into Earth, itself taking a lot of kinetic energy, smacking into the ground, releasing that energy into the ground, causing eruptions all around the world, causing massive tsunamis, waves crashing onto land. So that energy from the asteroid affected the whole Earth. And that energy also pushed a bunch of debris, smoke, ash, uh, rocks, all sorts of things into the air. And that debris formed a cloud around the earth, which cooled the earth off. Now those dinosaurs, they're about to die, but they still have chemical energy. Now, however they laid their bodies down to rest, they are now extinct. Cut to today, the gasoline that we use to power our cars is called a fossil fuel. The fuel we get literally comes from fossils, mostly fossilized trees, but other extinct formerly living things. So that chemical energy is now broken down into a goo that we might call shale or oil, sometimes also coal. Those 
fossil fuels are now full of chemical energy. And if they're heated up in a significant way, then they produce combustion, explosions. And those combustions of fossil fuel are what give us electrical energy. They're what power our cars. That combustion from fossil fuels, which are just fossilized, formerly living things that are still full of the same energy they had when they're alive. We can use them to make our cars go and to give us power as far as electrical power. So conservation is saving something and it not letting it be destroyed, not even needing to create new forms of it because you're saving it. So naturally, the universe saves energy. The universe conserves energy. It just changes the kind. This GIF here is a diagram of a car engine. So this is showing how that gasoline chemical energy gets converted into mechanical and thermal energy. So this is called the combustion chamber. Combustion is an explosion. It's a kind of chemical reaction. So that gasoline is mixed with oxygen in the air and a tiny little spark, a tiny electrical spark, and that is enough to create combustion. A bunch of tiny explosions are what power your car's engine. That pushes a piston down, which turns a crankshaft, which then moves air through the system. That then comes out as exhaust, as you can see here, in your car. That exhaust is a chemical. That's chemical energy. This is a chemical reaction. So there's chemical energy being converted into a different kind of chemical energy. But that's not the only thing that happens. You might notice that an engine can be really hot. You might have felt the hood of a car before after it's been driving for a long time. That's thermal energy coming out. And these little explosions, are explosions silent or do they make noise? Yeah, they make noise. So that's sonic energy as well. So in one kind of very common combustion reaction, we have a variety of different kinds of energy, but none of that energy is destroyed. Even when there's an explosion, even though we took that fuel, that gasoline, put it in there with some oxygen and a little tiny spark, that explosion saw no loss of energy. That energy simply went somewhere else. Another example of conservation of energy is photosynthesis, the way that plants get chemical energy from sunlight. So sunlight has heat thermal energy as well as electromagnetic, remember that light spectrum, full of energy. And plants are able, through a chemical reaction again, to save that light as sugar, to use a little bit of carbon dioxide and water and sunlight to form carbohydrates, certain kinds of sugars that they use for energy, and then release oxygen. So in this whole beautiful process that allows us as humans to be alive, there's no energy lost. That energy is simply changed around or conserved. Now it's your turn. Perform an experiment to prove that energy is conserved, never lost or destroyed. Maybe you bounce a ball and you observe the different ways that that energy is moved around. Maybe you heat something up and you note the ways that that energy is changed. However you do it, share what you find with a loved one. Now, we're gonna continue to talk about energy in our next lesson together next week. So keep those notes together and keep applying what we're learning and think about the different ways that you see energy being conserved. As always, it's been my pleasure having you in class today. I'm Mr. Steinauer, and I'll see you next week. Welcome to PE with Coach K, also known as Karina. This PE segment will aim towards third through fifth grade students for today and the entire semester. So for this segment today, we're going to focus on one of the health related fitness components, and that is cardiovascular endurance.
What is cardiovascular endurance? Well, cardiovascular endurance is where your heart, your lungs, and your muscles all work together while you're exercising for a long period or an extended period of time. How does that benefit us and our body? How does that benefit you and your mom, your dad? Well, cardiovascular endurance will help anybody sustain physical activity for a long period of time. And normally, you'll need this when you participate in a lot of different sports. For example, basketball. You have players that run up and down the court. They have to sustain and they have to be able to have heart, lungs, and muscles all working together to be able to maintain their breath when they are performing in a basketball game. Another example, soccer. A soccer field is even bigger than a basketball court, and they have to run up and down the field to be able to maintain that breath and that energy while they're playing soccer. So what you need for today is your heart, your muscles, and your lungs. That's it. Because for this first segment, I am going to teach you 10 different exercises that you can do at home, in your living room, in your bedroom, in the kitchen, wherever you are, where you have space and opportunity to improve your cardiovascular endurance. So I'll demonstrate each one. We'll do 10 of those for 30 seconds. It will be different each time. I'll demonstrate it. We'll do it for 30 seconds together. And then I'll demonstrate the next while you rest. So while I demonstrate is your opportunity to take a break, breathe, grab a drink of water, and then get ready for the next. So cardiovascular endurance exercise number one. Remember, all you need is your heart, your lungs, and your muscles, and maybe a bottle of water off to the side. So the first one we're going to do is just a jog in place. We're going to do it for 30 seconds. So it's just a light jog. It's not a sprint where you're running really fast, but you just want to be light on your feet. And we're going to do it for 30 seconds. And you can turn to the side with me. I'll turn to the side. I'll turn to the front. And then I'll turn to the other side. But it's up to you. You can stay forward or you can turn to the side as well. So we're going to do a jog in place for 30 seconds together, and then I'll demonstrate the next. Get ready to start in four, three, two, one, and let's jog. We're jogging very light. And when you jog, you want to make sure you're breathing in through your nose and just out through your mouth. Light little jog. I'm going to turn to the side. So you can get a different view. Make sure you pick your feet up just a little bit. The knees don't have to go too high. Three, two, one, and rest. So now you can rest and I'll demonstrate cardiovascular endurance exercise number two. So the second one we're going to do is high knees. So this is when our knees come up right in front of us while we're jumping and you'll bring your knees up as high as you can while jumping lean back just a little bit to get your knees up and we'll do those for 30 seconds so get ready take a deep breath let it out we'll start in four three two one high knees up make sure you breathe into your nose and out through your mouth. Keep going. Try to get them up as high as you can. You can turn sideways. Can you turn to the other side? You have five, four, three, two, and rest. Okay. Cardiovascular endurance exercise number three. These are called heel kicks, where your heel is kicking your bottom, just like this. So you should feel 
Your heel touch your bottom when you do your heel kicks. And we'll do that for 30 seconds. Take a deep breath. We'll start in five, four, three, two, and one. Heel kicks. Remember to breathe because we're exercising our heart, muscles, and lungs to strengthen our cardiovascular endurance. You have 10 more seconds. And five, four, three, two, and rest. Take a deep breath in and let it out. Cardiovascular endurance exercise number four. We are going to do jumping jacks or sometimes I call them JJs for short. So we'll go ahead and do some jumping jacks for 30 seconds. Remember, your legs open and when your legs open, your arms come above your head and then they close together. And then you keep going, open, close, open, close. So if you get a little out of breath in between, then you can slow it down. Or if you feel like you got enough energy to go faster, then you can, it's up to you. But we're gonna start it, take a deep breath. In five, four, three, two, one, and go. Open, close, open, close. 30 seconds. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. If you need to slow down, it's okay. Or you can speed it up. 10 more seconds. Come on. And five, four, three, two, and rest. So, cardiovascular endurance exercise number five. And I'm just gonna do five for this segment. You can have enough energy to do five more for the next. So the fifth one is just a jump rope motion. So you just roll your arms on the side of you and you just slightly come off your toes, very slightly, nice little jump with your arms going in a circular motion as if you were jumping rope. We'll do that for 30 seconds. Take this time to rest while I'm demonstrating and talking, you know, use all of this time you can because we are starting in four, three, two, one, and jump rope. Breathe and out through your mouth. Come on, this is the last one. Remember, we're here to improve our cardiovascular endurance. It's okay if you're running out of energy, that's normal. Because that means you are working your heart, lungs, and muscles all at the same time. We have 10 more seconds. Can you make it? Speed it up. Five, four, three, two, one, and rest. All right, so we just went over five exercises that you can do at home to improve your cardiovascular endurance wherever you are when you have the space and opportunity. Remember, what is cardiovascular endurance? Cardiovascular endurance is when your heart, your lungs, and your muscles all work together while you're exercising for a long period of time. And this helps you because it helps you sustain physical activity for a long time. So I'm so happy that you joined in today when we were working on our cardiovascular endurance. I want you to practice at home, gather members, sisters, brothers, whoever around you that you can grab to come and join you and work on your cardiovascular endurance together. First one we did, jog in place. 
and you can do it for a longer period, longer period of time than 30 seconds. You can take it to one minute. So the more you do it, the better you get, the more you can increase your time. First one was jogging in place. Second one, high knees. The third one, heel kick, where you kick your bottom. The fourth one, what was the fourth one? I think the fourth one was jumping jacks. Yep, there we go. There goes my memory. And then the last one was the jump rope, where your arms go in a circular motion as if you were jumping rope. Well, thank you, and I hope to see you next week for a fun cardio challenge. Adios. Hello, I'm Mr. Gartner, your homeroom music teacher, back at you again. Okay, today we're going to do some stuff dealing with food, like hot dogs, grape soda, apple pie, hot fudge sundae. Does that make you hungry? It makes me hungry, because I like to eat. But we're not going to eat those things, we're going to play those things, okay? Because remember, we did our new learning uh, procedure, which is what? Eye it. Ear it, say it, play it. Let me hear you say it. Make sure that you're pointing while you're saying it. Eye it, ear it, say it, and play it. Okay, so we're gonna do some things. Rhythm is built, some rhythms are built around food. Okay, so you can say some things like mm, hot dog, hot dog. That's a quarter note, hot dog. Those are all quarters, hot dog, hot dog. Hot dog, okay? So if I want to say grape soda, grape soda. That's the quarter note than the eighth note. Grape soda, grape soda. Hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, grape soda. Hot dog, hot dog, grape soda, okay? So you can do another one like apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie. That is an eighth note and a quarter note. OK, so these rhythms are, are real simple and you can just sit there and just think about food. Hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, grape soda, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, grape soda, grape soda, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, grape soda. Hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, great soda. See how those rhythms come together by just saying food? And you're actually saying it. If you can say it, you can play it, okay? Whatever you say, you can, you can play it. So what if I said Rice Krispie Treats? That seems like it's a lot, doesn't it? Rice Krispie Treats. Could I play that? Rice Krispie Treats. Rice Krispie Treats. Rice Krispie Treats. Rice Krispie Treats. So I guess you're wondering, what rhythm is that? That is an eighth note tied to a sixteenth note followed by a quarter note. Almost like you're saying a pizza. Pepperoni with sausage and all. Nope, this is just an eighth note tied to a sixteenth note tied to a quarter note. It's running across your screen. You can see it. Eighth note tied to a sixteenth note tied to, not even tied to a quarter, the quarter stands alone, okay? So we got Rice Krispie Treat, Rice Krispie Treat, Rice Krispie Treat, Rice Krispie Treat, okay? Let's do something else. Let's do, I like strawberries and I like chocolate. Let's put it together. So let's say chocolate strawberries. Chocolate strawberry, chocolate strawberry, chocolate strawberry. Chocolate, strawberry, chocolate, strawberry. So now I just played an eighth note, two eighth notes, and then an eighth note tied to a sixteenth. Okay? Once again, it's running across your screen. You can see it. Okay? And all you have to do is sit down and say these foods that you like. Well, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog, chocolate, strawberry, chocolate, strawberry. Rice Krispie Treat, Rice Krispie Treat, Rice Krispie Treat, 
Rice Krispie Treat. Okay, so let's go over one more, a few more of these. I don't really like coconuts, but you know, some people like coconut shrimp. I love shrimp though, but I'm not fond of coconut. Coconut, eh, not that fond of that. So let's do coconut shrimp. How would that sound? Coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp. So now I'm playing a 16th tied to an eighth note followed by a quarter note. Once again, you can see it strolling across your screen. 16th note tied to an eighth note and a quarter note standing by itself. Okay, so we did hot dog, grape soda, apple pie, hot fudge sundae, coconut shrimp, rice crispy treats, and chocolate strawberry. So we can't have chocolate strawberries without having strawberry ice cream. It just sounds like it just fits, right? So let's add that. What would, a, what would the rhythm sound like if we said strawberry ice cream? Strawberry ice cream. Strawberry ice cream. Strawberry ice cream. Strawberry ice cream. So now we play an eighth note tied to a sixteenth and two eighth notes at the end. Okay? Again, you can see it on the screen. Okay? Strawberry ice cream. Strawberry ice cream. Strawberry ice cream. Strawberry ice cream. Chocolate strawberries. Chocolate strawberries. Chocolate strawberries. Hot dog. Hot dog. Hot dog. Grape soda. Grape soda. Apple pie. Apple pie. Apple pie. Coconut shrimps. Coconut shrimps. Coconut shrimps. Rice Krispie Treat. Rice Krispie Treat. Rice Krispie Treat. Rice Krispie Treat, Rice Krispie Treat, Rice Krispie Treat. See how all those patterns are coming together? You're actually playing rhythms, okay? You're playing rhythms, rhythms to food that we all love, because I know I love food, okay? So you can sit down and just not even have really anything in front of you. If you can say it, remember, if you can say it, you can play it, okay? Let's say if, if I just said pepperoni pizza. How would I do that? I like pizza. I like pepperoni. Pepperoni pizza, 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 pepperoni pizza. So what I'm playing there is sixteenths and an eighth note, two eighth notes at the end. Pepperoni pizza, pepperoni pizza, pepperoni pizza, pepperoni pizza. Okay, so that's how that works. You're saying that food? Okay, I can hear you asking me to do another one. Okay, I'm going to do another one for you, okay? What about cheese raviolis? Cheese raviolis. Hmm, it's making me hungry again, okay? So let's go cheese raviolis. Cheese raviolis. Cheese raviolis. Cheese raviolis. Okay, so I'm playing a quarter note. And sixteenths, a quarter notes, sixteenths. Cheese raviolis, cheese raviolis, cheese raviolis, cheese raviolis. Grape soda, grape soda, apple pie, apple pie, hot Sunday, hot Sunday, hot Sunday, hot Sunday, hot Sunday. See how I changed that? When it's really hot fudge Sunday. Hot fudge Sunday, hot fudge Sunday. Okay, different patterns work. Coconut shrimp, coconut shrimp, rice crispy treats, rice crispy treats, strawberry, 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 strawberry. You can say any food and play to it. Okay, it's a pattern that you're learning. Okay, it's a very simple pattern. Strawberry ice cream, strawberry ice cream, strawberry ice cream. Pepperoni pizza, pepperoni pizza, pepperoni pizza. Hot dog, hot dog, hot diggity 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 dog. I just made that up, okay? So you can make up your own patterns with food, okay? Your favorite food, whatever you like. If you like s'mores, 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 s'mores. Okay, so whatever you like. If you like mm, chocolate chip, 
chocolate chip, chocolate chip, chocolate chip, chocolate chip. If you like chocolate chip and ice cream, chocolate chip 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 ice cream. Okay, so you see how it works? You get the idea of it? It's real simple and it's teaching you patterns, okay? Sometimes you may not know the pattern that you're playing, but eventually you'll understand the quarter notes and eighth notes, okay? Because that's all you're playing, quarter notes, eighth, quarter notes, eighth notes, sixteenths, eighths tied to sixteenths, or um, sixteenths by themselves with the quarter note behind it, okay? These are all rhythmatic patterns that you're doing to help you, okay? And it's just to have fun with it, okay? Just sit down and just have fun. You can turn on some music and do it. You can do whatever you want with it, okay? But remember, you want to plan out your practice. So whatever you want to get accomplished by doing these food rhythm exercises, make sure that you have something lined out before you start. Make sure that you're not just wasting time. Once again, practice does not make perfect. So don't even listen to that. If someone say that, correct them quickly. Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. And then they're gonna say, what's perfect practice? Perfect practice is I plan out what I wanna achieve when I'm practicing. So I'm not wasting time, okay? That's the way you wanna practice, okay? I'm Mr. Gardner, your homeroom music teacher. It was a delight teaching you this, and I'll see you next time.